you. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invite to um, talk to you today. I'm, I'm, uh, as Nicholas said, I'm from the Urban Institute. I'm here with two co colleagues, two professorial fellows, Beth Perry and Vanessa Gustin-Brotto, are speaking tomorrow. Um, so we've got, a, we've, uh, as a research centre, as a research institute, we have an agenda that looks at a number of thematic priorities. And today, I want to talk about a body of work that's related to some uh, a theme. Let's try and look at the sort of post-smart city around automation and robotics. Um, when, when, I saw, when I saw the um, invitation, uh, well, I, was very, I, was very, I was very struck by what Alistair said about brand wagons. And today we've heard about the spontaneous city. And when I saw the invitation to the intelligent city, I thought, oh, this might be interesting. There might be an opportunity to constitute a research trajectory around the intelligent city. And I tried to have a look to see what had been written about the notion of the intelligent city. And there's not very much, actually, bizarrely. Um, in this slide, there's some images that uh, appear when you search intelligent city that very much resonate with the notion of the smart city. People who do searches on intelligent cities are also looking at questions around smart cities. And the only sort of way in which I found a sort of coherent statement was actually a, a, a working paper by Accenture, the management consultants. And they talked about um, a new kind of intelligent infrastructure, innovative open platform based on smart technologies that can help forward-looking cities more predictably integrate a complex suite of services cost-effectively <coughs> at pace and at scale. Now, if that sounds like the resonant of perhaps corporate speak, there's a reason for that. And there's something quite interesting about the origins of the intelligent city debate as it's currently constituted. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about five contemporary mythologies of the intelligent city. And the logic of this is really trying to think behind some of the hidden assumptions, history, the logics that inform the debate about the intelligent city. Um, and it's a, it's a way of trying to, 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 to really put it under a little bit of scrutiny, this concept, this poorly understood chaotic concept that might provide uh, the basis of launching a research career if it could be looked at uh, critically and strategically. So the, the five myths are, in a sense, an attempt to try to sort of think, if, if the intelligent city is also is about transparency through dashboards, control rooms, apps, I think it's also about a new form of black boxing. So what I want to try to do is reveal a little bit about the re-black boxing that takes place in the intelligent cities debate. And the first myth is the idea that intelligent cities are a contemporary phenomenon. Can anyone give, take a guess when Intelligent Cities first appears in a, in a publication? 1937. 18, 1841, <laughs> in reference to Boston being an intelligent city. It's first used in planning in the 1890s. But actually, if you, look at the, if you look at the computational use of the notion of intelligent cities, you go back to the 1950s, 60s and 70s. In this absolutely fantastic book by um, Jennifer Light from Warfare to Welfare, Welfare she charts how modelling and control systems that were developed in the, the military and defence sectors were actually applied in a systematic way in the US, in US cities, New York, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh. And she talks about the way in which the history of cyber cities is better understood from an appreciation of the simulations in the context of military war games at RAND and MIT. RAND Corporation and a whole set of other consultancies with Donald Douglas set up departments in US cities to apply these computational systems to the urban crisis. And it would, be really, it would have been really good when we started thinking about smart cities for someone to excavate this history. There's a superb book by a journalist called The Fire, who looks at the, um, the role of the Rand Corporation's work in New York, where basically the model told them to close down all the firehouses in the areas with the most fires, which is what they did, which caused a crisis in the Bronx in terms of depopulation and subsequent um, re removal of population and, and, and some really quite disturbing consequences that followed from that as a result of using a computational model that was basically wrong. The second myth, intelligent city products, so the sorts of products that are sold to cities, are novel technologies. They're not novel technologies at all. A lot of the technologies are predictive analytics, control systems, operating systems, are actually existing computational software products 
that were developed and applied primarily in the corporate sector. So when you start to look behind these software systems, they're not actually new systems. They're actually old systems that have been repurposed for an urban context. <coughs> so if you look at the origins of uh, urban operating systems, what you find is, is these are very large integrated uh, informational products that were being sold into the corporate sector that are now being sold to urban, to urban authorities. So this is about the transmutation and the tweaking of a set of software. And you can download the manual for the IBM Intelligent Operating Center for smart cities, and it's indistinguishable from the manual that's written for the same piece of software for corporate applications. And you can see the consequences of that in the way in which the notion of the city, the concept of the city is problematized in these software systems. So this is about managing the city as an entire entity. Um, and if you look at the last sentence, I think this is really quite profound. They talk about the way in which any city or enterprise has both faced many of the same issues. So the software systems themselves are designed to manage corporate entities and the interrelations between different corporate parts of the corporate entity are also being transmuted into the urban context. Third myth, intelligent cities seamlessly integrate urban life. When you look at the way in which these uh, systems are sold, you often see diagrams like this that attempt to show all sorts of connections between currently disconnected aspects of urban life, infrastructure, um, and the claim is that these, that these systems are able to form connections where connections don't currently exist for institutional, techno technological, or other reasons, often very good reasons why there's not interconnections. The grim reality, though, is the way that these sorts of software systems work is not necessarily by seamlessly integrating everything. They're about a form of selectivity. They disassemble the urban context into informational systems, uh, data, and infrastructure, and they rebuild, selectively rebuild connections. So if you think about digital platforms, digital platforms are all about disaggregation and reaggregation but they re-aggregate what's valuable or what can be turned into a product and service. Myth number four, intelligent cities provide neutral decision making. Well, this is not a neutral process. If successful cities invent themselves through a relentless focus on providing value by becoming efficient and effective enterprises, some consequences will follow from that that might be problematic. And when you start to look at some of the recent work that's being done on the consequences of the application of these systems, there's a really nice literature emerging about the role of socio-spatial socio sorting and the way in which these technologies actually reinforce existing for social, economic and often environmental disparities. These, these systems aren't, don't, aren't neutral. They actually are about segmentation, forms of control for, for the low in income and poor communities, and embody of racist assumptions as well. Myth five, the final one. Intelligent city products are flexible and fit different urban contexts. So the, the market for uh, these products is um, forecast to be absolutely huge. There's one here, just, uh, just picked up uh, recently, $2.5 trillion by 2025. The, the market for these uh, in, integrated informational products in the corporate sector is difficult. So the urban market is seen as being an area where large complex systems can be re repurposed and resold into a new market. The problem is cities aren't configured like corporate entities. Corporate entities often have standard accounting rules. They have, within a particular regional context, they might have to organize themselves according to regulatory and legal frameworks. So actually there's been a real issue for the um, software product sector of selling a complex informational product in a market where it's not always clear who the client is and the urban context is very diverse. And they want to avoid something the software sector calls gentrification. They don't want to match the software to the particular contingent characteristics of every urban context. So what they're trying to do is something quite different. There's an attempt to, and I, I won't suggest that you read all of this, this is just to give you a flavour of the scope and scale of activity on smart city standard making that's being undertaken at the moment. And the logic of this 
is to reconfigure, the logic of this in a sense is to reconfigure urban context to match the presuppositions of the software systems that are being sold as intelligent city products. And this is about conformity, compliance and rationalisation to take processes of urban decision making to match the way in which the computational system understands the world. And a really nice example of that is the World Council on City Data, there you can get platinum designation if you collect urban data in a particular format that can match the format of the, of the software systems. So, just to summarise then, long and problematic history of intelligent city ideas. Uh, they're not novel, these are about the transmutation of techniques from other sectors into the urban context. They're not about seamlessness, they're about selectivity. They actually are about processes of socio-spatial sorting. There is, there is contingency, but they operate in a context of bias. And the software itself is almost like a form of electronic concrete. You have to reshape the context to match the software itself. So for me, intelligent city, a, a, few, a few issues. The way in which, if we have a techno-economic view of the intelligent city, the code itself is closed, the logic and conditions of its production cannot be questioned, and the priorities and other forms of knowledge are subordinated to the logic of um, code and computational-based intelligence. Operational ra rationalities that are developed in other contexts, then, are transmuted into urban contexts. So this becomes about re-engineering modularity, efficiency, continuity, and security, it starts sort to of reinvent the city as a, as a responsive logistical enterprise. And I'm not denying that there isn't benefits that could be associated with that in particular sorts of infrastructural configurations, but this is not about transformation, it's about an efficiency-orientated argument. And finally, this is about also a form of world-making. There's an attempt to establish a global and singular computational logic of urban control through standard-setting processes that seek to match urban decision-making structures and data collection to the presuppositions of the software. Thank you.